I know we just had you uh, part of the panel. It was a great panel. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just want to get your overall experience with your career and being a, a woman in blues and how has it impacted you? Well, I didn't start blues until I was in my 30s, but um, like I said, my father was Tommy Tucker. He wrote the High Hill Sneakers Classic of 1964. And uh, it's been done by the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Elvis Presley, Stevie Wonder. And I think I got my singing ability from him. Well, I sang in church most of my life until he passed away on my birthday in 1982. And I had a German promoter contact me and say, do you sing blues? We'd like to bring you to Europe. And uh, I told him no, but I can learn it. And they sent me a cassette tape with like 20 songs on it. And I learned the songs and the rest is history. I've been going back and forth to Europe for 30 years now. And I've been in the blues business for about 30 something years. So, but I also worked a regular job while I did that. So, uh, but I fell in love with blues. And when I fell in love with blues, I fell in love with the music, especially the history, the culture. and. Uh, I, I, I love blues. I just wish that we could preserve it a little better with the young folks today. And I'm not sure how we can do that, but we need to work on that. Yes, ma'am. I think that you really had a way of connecting with the youth through your presentation, having the music. I personally, uh, you know, you were talking about my brain, and I love that movie. I love that play. So, uh, it's I want to ask you, do you have any personal experience uh, that you want to share with the late B.B. King? Uh, a moment that you shared with B.B. King? Yes, ma'am. Um, I opened up for B.B. King in Dresden, Germany in 1994 or 96. And at the time, he had discovered he had diabetes. And he was feeling really bad that day. But I opened up for him. And I just sang a couple extra songs because I knew he was coming on a little later. And then I met B.B. again uh, at the Monterey Bay Blues Festival in 2010, I think it was, and I was crowned Blues Artist of the Year. And he, asked, he invited me and a couple of my players on his bus, and we went on his bus to, to talk to him, and he really was enlightening. I love B.B. B.B.'s a good guy, and he always will give you some advice about something. So he told me one time, he said, you're not just a blues singer, you're a singer. You know, and so that, that inspired me. But I've been coming back to this for the last seven years since he passed away and being a part of the, the uh, symposium. So, Thank you so much. That's, that's all for our interview today. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're Thank welcome. You. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. So. All right, if I can get you to start off by stating your name and um, spelling it for me I'm just and the time. who you are. Okay, Theodore Arthur Jr. is my name. T H E O D O R E A R T H U R J R Theodore Arthur Jr. Pritchard, Alabama. Okay. So Mr. Arthur, um, first off I want to thank you for your performance up there. Yes. And uh, being a part of the BB King Day uh, symposium today. Uh, my first question to you is about your performance. Uh, it was very lively up there performing with BB Queen and Miss Nellie Mack. Uh, what is it like performing on stage? Uh, also, considering that you perform with BB King and uh, how did Bobby Bland as well? How, what is the chemistry like when working with those big names and also working with BB Queen and Miss Nellie Mack? Well, you have to understand one thing. Music is a universal language. It's just like the Bible. It's telling a story, and it has to have some feeling and meaning to it with some rhythm. So wherever I find that, it's, at, it's home for me. Yeah, no matter what country, who I'm with, if they can play that groove correctly, I'm at home. How long have you been doing music? Okay, I've been playing professionally for 63 years. This is the 63rd year I've been in music as an independent musician. As a matter of fact, I'm celebrating my 63rd anniversary on October the 8th in Mobile, Alabama at the locale. And uh, by the way, my 
my longtime friend, Mr. Fred Wesley, will be my special guest. He'll be the speaker. Yes, sir. Thank you yes. for sharing that. Yes. And uh, one final question for you. Do you have a... Uh, one of your most, what is one of your most memorable moments with the late Vivian King? What? One of your most memorable moments with Mr. Vivian King? Oh, one of my most memorable moments was in 1972. He came and played a concert in Mobile and uh, we were jamming at a club called Club Harlem and he came by there and played with us and uh, he offered me a job that night. He said, well, Theodore, come on and join the band. I said, I'll pay you 18000 a year. Well, I said, let me think about it, Mr. King. But in the meantime, Bobby Bland had sent for me to come back to work with him. And my allegiance was with Bobby because uh, his arranger and uh, one of the saxophone players, uh, Don Mark, uh, taught me jazz and blues. Mr. Joe Scott taught me orchestration and arranging. And Mr. Bobby Bland, that horn I'm playing right now, he helped me buy that horn. So I, I, had, a, I had an obligation to go back to play with him. I mean, I love B.B. King. He's a great man. And he, you know, we, we like that. Now, my friend that got me the first job with Little Junior Parker was B.B. Uh, King's bass player, the late Mr. Uh, Marshall Yawk. That's how I got hooked up with that, that whole scene. Uh, so. I love B.B. King. He was a great person. We had a good relationship. And I was on the album with B.B. King and Bobby Bland together for the first time. It's the main reason why I was able to be invited to the B.B. King celebration these last five years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, one final question. I just thought about it. Um, so, as you know, we're recognizing the women in blues for yes. this year's symposium. What do you think is the important takeaway as we're putting an emphasis on recognizing women and blues. What is something that you hope the crowd can take away from today? Well, let me say this. I'm an equal opportunity employer. I have four, six women in my organization right now. My drummer, my guitar player, the trombone player. Is, all of these are females, and then I have four singers, four girl singers, the authorettes. So, I love have women in my organization. I love, when they can play, they can stay. If they can't play, they got to hit the road. Yes, sir. I understand that. Thank you so much, Mr. Arthur, for taking yes, the time. Now, what's your name, sir? Uriah. Uriah. It's a pleasure, man. I appreciate you so much. Yes, sir. Okay, and thank y'all. This is all mine. Can I get a copy of this? Sure. We are piecing it together. Okay. Because, you know, it's going to be for the museum for the organization. So we'll be sure to share a copy with you. Yes, indeed. Thank you, brother. Got a card? Yes, sir. yes, sir. You know I do. I got one just for you. Yes, sir. Lord, let me stop. <laughs> it's all right. We're going to get you to start off by uh, spelling your name and telling us a little bit about yourself. Okay. I'm going to try to make it brief because yes, it, it's a couple of years or stuff. <laughs> my name is Nellie Mac Ennis. However, my stage name is Nellie Mac. And how it became Nellie Mac was. I was doing a little neighborhood festival years before I became who I am, whomever I am today. And I heard it on the radio, and I had given Nellie Mac, but somewhere along the line in the paper, it came up MC. So the radio announcer said, and that will also be Nellie MC. And I turned around and looked at the radio. I said, okay. What we got to do is spell this thing out completely so it can be pronounced as that. So that's how Nellie McInnes became Nellie Mac. And I've been in this thing. I started playing behind Sam Myers professionally. He's a legend in the blues. A lot of people know him. I started playing behind him in 1973. Don't you ask my age. <laughs> so since then, of course, I played with, I uh, performed with Clark Terry, Dizzy Gillespie, Ellis Marcellus, um, Henry Mancini, the Pink Panther guy, um, uh, Ollie Nightingale, Billy Soul Buns, uh, Franco, Pat Brown, uh, just numerous of people 
opened shows for many more, Bobby Bland and a lot of others. Now I have my own group and had it since the early 2004. I have a jazz group, a uh, quartet, have a trio, have a duo, and I have the Nellie Mack Project, which everybody's familiar with, the big group. And I just love what I do. I play all genres of music. Well, I like to hold the bass doing them. <laughs> and I'm enjoying myself, having fun. This thing was not easy. And I don't want you to think it was. Uh, there have been many sleepless nights. Many nights I've cried to my eyes, had swollen so, because I felt like I was not being accepted and being shut out of everything because I am female. I won the Governor's Arts Award this year, 2020, the first time ever they've given it to a female bass player on the low end. And that's the state of Mississippi it was 43 candidates and they were major. I didn't think I had a ghost of a chance. Never thought about it no more until I got the call. And when she told me I had won the Governor's Arts Award, I dropped the phone. I said, why are you saying that? <laughs> so, but God is good and what God has for you is for you. Keep some humor about yourself because you're going to be frowning a many times. And the more humor you keep about yourself, the less you're going to frown. Be kind to others and try to treat people the way you want to be treated. And keep empathy in mind. Put yourself in other people's position and try to, try to help them and see their point of view. But students, stay with it, whatever it is you believe in and you love. Don't have to be music. I, I will tell you this. Do not major in music. Minor if you just got to do something in music. But major in business, anything as computer. You got to make some money to try to push yourself. That's me. That's my story. Right now I'm shooting for the moon. I might land on a star. And I thank God for it. Yes, ma'am. Set a mouthful. Thank you so much, Miss Matt. Hey. That was beautiful. Thank you. Welcome. Thank, you. Thank you. I think you're going to make a lot of paper. I don't, I don't have to bother like you, do. What do you, know what you mean? <laughs> this is, you can make some paper. Yes, ma'am. I love what I do. Just like you said, I'm shooting for the moon. Did you might land on, on a little star, baby. Ain't nothing wrong with Ain't that. Ain't nothing wrong with living on a star. Yes, ma'am. You still can push the button raise that, that, that car garage up here full of five. Somebody got to push it. Thank you so much, Miss Matt. You're quite welcome. Okay. So I've been talking to Mr. Terrell and he told me that you and him played a vital role in starting B.B. King uh, Day at MVSU. So I just had a couple of questions to ask you. Uh, tell me how important uh, this day is for the campus and how it plays a role in preserving and honoring the legacy of the late B.B. King. Well, from, from a university standpoint, you know, it's always um, logical, you know, for us to be trying to do more with education. And so B.B.'s life and role as a bluesman, he spent quite a bit of time visiting not just this university, which he did for a number of years doing workshops and clinics, you know, for people, did most of them to pull the community together. But B.B.'s knowledge surpassed uh, his concept of just music training. He was always involved in trying to better himself and educate himself because he traveled a lot. He saw a lot of things. And we know from uh, Mississippi Valley State's point of view, and as I was chairing the fine arts area, that it was almost a no-brainer that we have to do something to honor the respect uh, and give the respect due to B.B. King. So we started, just thought of an idea, and then I went to Robert at the university about uh, doing a, a symposium where we would bring in people and talk about these histories. Many, many of the things are not written down. Uh, some of them, you know, for fear of, of, you know, people maybe sometimes have fear, but being too shy to talk about some of those things, many of them were, you know, racial problems in the yesteryear you know, in the early years, you know, where America was crafting out its own cultural environment to be the America that we know of. And we're still having some of those struggles still. But this history gives us at least a footing and a way to look back at it and not make those same mistakes again. And that was important 
you know, for B.B. King, and it certainly has been important for us to continue to, to share that. And when we talk about legacy, B.B. was a living legacy among many others probably, but his journey was from this Mississippi Delta to the entire world. B.B. was playing nearly 90 countries a year near the end of his death, you know, before, before his death, you know. So that's important. And, and I think that travel for all of us, it takes us on journeys. If we don't travel there physically, we can travel there mentally when we hear each other talk about some of these histories. It makes us think, makes us rethink. Yeah, very important, very important. Yes, thank you for that. Um, my next question to you is, how important is it to honor the women in blues, considering that this is B.B. King Day? Uh, what is the significance of honoring the women who have paved the way for themselves in a male-dominant profession? Well, yeah, uh, I, I understand that question in terms of how it might look on the surface, you know, that we're a male-dominant society and so forth, and we have women who are trying to climb these ladders to become equal. Yeah, that's, that's true, but then when you think about the history that we're hearing today, we're seeing that women were at the forefront. They set many of these ceilings that, that have been broken, and many times they set ceilings that they broke themselves, you know, to get beyond those uh, stereotypes. And I think that if you could take the, some of the men who were involved in the, in the start of some of their careers, they might even be able to tell us stories about, like, uh, such as what Bobby Rush shared with us today. You know, women have been very important, you know, to this. And not just important for the sake of, of, of saying they were important, they were some of the first people, you know, that not that we have to try to make something of an honor to a woman, but they were some of the first people to do some of these things. Like, we wouldn't have the, we wouldn't have the concept of stage entertainment without without a woman that was you know and then we wouldn't have concepts about some of the other things that women brought to the table when it came down to being able to talk to people and especially in the black culture women were able to move far more things out of their way than men were because if men were black men were seen outspoken they could lose their lives many times. I mean, you even, even say blues, if you go up into some of the history that we're talking about, they won't talk about Billie Holiday because she was more crafted toward the jazz idiom. But Billie sang the blues, and, and also it was noted, too, that she refused to go in back doors. You know, she held her head up high, and women were able to do that as, as, a, as a whole. You know, we probably wouldn't even have civil rights movements that America knows about, you know, without the undergirding of women in it. Yes, sir, you made a very valid point, especially considering Miss uh, Tucker's presentation and mm -hmm. all the women that she presented to mm -hmm. us. Uh, yeah. Very valuable piece of information, mm -hmm. a very valuable point that I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't take into account. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. Oh, very, very welcome. Uh, my final question to you is, is there a specific moment, one of your most memorable moments that you would like to share with us that you share with the late B.B. King? Mm, I don't know if, it, if it's one thing that I thought of. It's just uh, B.B. and I were talking one time in a hotel in Shreveport. He invited me to his room, and uh, there was a couple of other special guests there. But we got to talking kind of by ourselves while everybody else was talking, and I asked him a question. I said, B.B. King, uh, when did you know you were B.B. King? And he stopped and paused for a long time, and then he said, you know, I've been, never been asked that question. He said, but uh, thinking about it, he was saying when young people began to notice his music, because he had been out there a long time, you know. And so it, it started to make sense. He was saying that, that people started to, to give him that honor and recognition as B.B. As, as King, the king, you know, the blues. And so I think that that was pretty inspirational for me that I actually had to, had B.B. King to pause and rethink some things, you know. And so, yeah, that's memorable to me, among some other things. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you, Mr. Sanders, for taking time out of your busy day and being here for the symposium and doing this interview for me. It would be a big help for what yeah. we're trying to do here. Yeah, well, I'm honored. Yes, sir. Very, very honored. Thank, thank you so much, Thank Mr. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,
Okay, Mr. Terrell. So my first question to you is, you, as uh, alongside Mr. Alfonso Sanders, played a vital role in starting BB King Day. Tell us how important this day is to the campus and how it plays a role in preserving and honoring the legacy of the late BB King. Well, you're absolutely correct. Alfonso and I did start it. Um, we thought it was very really important because we knew that BB had dedicated a lot of time and energy to Mississippi Valley. This is the only place that there was a Mississippi, uh, there was a BB King recording studio on this particular campus. So why not? I mean, this is where it should be. BB uh, was actually born in Berkeley, where they call it uh, Itabena, which is right outside of Itabena. Uh, if you were living in a big city, then you would call it a suburb. So, you know, he lived, he, he grew up, he was born here in the suburb. So why not bring it back to this school? This is where it need to be. Uh, this is where BB is from. And as far as this university, this is the university that started it all. When you talk about being a blues man, or being a person from the Delta, this is it, you know? So we need to be here. Yes, sir. Thank you for sharing it with us, and thank you for the work that you've done here on the symposium today. Um, would you do us a favor and describe how you and Alfonso Sanders uh, came up with the proposal for BB King Day? What was going through your head when the idea of a day dedicated to BB King came to you? You know, originally there was a day dedicated to BB uh, by the state of Mississippi. They made February 15th, 2005, BB King Day. No one had took advantage, took advantage of that day. Nobody was doing anything on February 15th. So after BB passed away, BB uh, and Alfonso was really, really close. After he passed away, Alfonso, before BB was really cold in his grave, came to me at the museum and started talking about, what do you think about us doing something? And I was like, why not? Let's do something. We came up with the idea to do BB King Day to honor him, then we had to come up with a date. Well, we know B.B. was born in September. His birthday is September the 16th. But instead of trying to say September 16th because it'll change every year, that date will change, then we just decided to do first Thursday in September, which is his birth month. And we'll make that the day that we do B.B. King Day annually. Um, we had to go through some processes, you know, of course, to partner with the museum because we are actually the B.B. King Museum and there's a B.B. King studio, like I say here. Uh, I had to go through the estate to get the authorization to be able to do it, to use his name like that. And uh, once we did that, it just, it just flowed out. You know, he and I started talking about what we wanted to get done, who we wanted to have. And it was really important to get a lot of the legendary people, the people who worked with B.B. at an early age, uh, and they were already elderly. We wanted to get them here and start this thing before anything happened. And fortunately, we were able to get a lot of his band members who passed on that very next year. We were able to get like Otis Clay, who was not here the next year. I mean, different people like that. We got Denise LaSalle on the first one, and um, two years later, she was gone. So we were able to get a lot of the people that was influenced by BB, people who worked for BB. And then from there on, we just started coming up with a subject every year. So every year has been a different subject. Uh, based on just the blues itself. Uh, this year we did choose women in blues because women have played a vital role in the blues market, period. As a matter of fact, the first blues song that was recorded was recorded by a woman, and that's what we're here to show people today. Uh, just to make sure that we keep educating people on what it's all about, where it come from, and how we need to continue the legacy and continue to teach. And y'all are doing a great job with that, especially I keep referring back to um, Miss uh, Teeny Tucker's mm -hmm. presentation where she was talking about uh, Ma Rainey. I love Ma Rainey. I saw her play on Netflix and everything, and mm -hmm. I love that movie. Uh, but that brings me to my next question, which is how important is it to honor women in blues, especially considering that today is B.B. King Day? What is the significance of honoring the women who have paved the way for themselves in a male-dominant well, let's, let's, let's back it up like that. First of all, women are the mothers. I mean, without a woman, there ain't a man, okay? So women have always played a role in the blues because they support, even if there was just their husbands on the road, they supported him. So we knew that it was important to talk about the women's role in blues. The women has been recording and performing 
all over the world for many years. That's why we really felt it was important to do that. Yes, sir. And my one final question for you is, is there a moment that you would like to share with us that uh, is your most memorable moment that you shared with the late B.B. King? Well, with B.B., I think some of the things, that there are so many different moments. I mean, B.B. would do something like just pop up on us, you know, especially at the museum. You know, all of a sudden you get a call, oh, my gosh, B.B. will be here in 30 minutes. And, uh, you know, he was just kind of spontaneous like that when he was ever in the area. But for me, just watching him come into the exhibit and looking at a lot of the panels and the pictures on the wall and just him reflecting back to the things that he had went through at that time because he remembered all those times. He remembered the people uh, that were on those, on those panels, people that he hadn't seen for years and years. And he was wondering, where did y'all get a picture of him from, you know? I mean, it's amazing how that thing happened. So there were so many different things with B.B. I, I remember the last festival that he did. And uh, my job at that point was to produce his festivals as well. And I went to the bus and I talked to him on the bus before it was time for him to come off to go on the stage. And then so he walked out and, you know, I held his hand and brought him on down the, the steps of the bus for him to go up on the stage. And, you know, he just said to me, yeah, come on, hold my hand because I ain't like I used to be. And it was just amazing to see a person that when you touch his hand, it feels so soft and, you know, and it's not calloused all up for a person who played a guitar and didn't really use a pick a lot. He always used the fingers. So it was just so many things about B.B. He went into the club that night and he actually stayed on the stage till 6.30 in the morning. He was just a generous person with his time and uh, how I use an example now with all the staff at the B.B. King Museum. It's like people wear those little bracelets and say, what would Jesus do? I said, well, what would B.B. do? I mean, what would B.B. do? He would actually give you time, any kind of time. I mean, he would never uh, look down on anybody. And that's one thing I really respect about him. He kept himself grounded. And he went and played in all those old juke joints that got him started, in addition to going and play at all these places, these big arenas all over the world. And that, that says something to me about the man itself. I just adore him and his character. And that's what's important. I want to thank you, Mr. Terrell, for taking time. I know you got to set up here, so we're going to let you go. Thank you for being here and doing this interview for us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You're yes, right. Sir. So we're just going to pretend like the camera not even there. You're just going to talk to me, all right? Okay. So if you could start off by telling me your name and what it is that you do. And I really want to know. How is BB King Day significant to you? Uh, yes, truly, my name is Sam Joyner. I grew up around Chicago, and BB King was the man at the time that I grew up. You know, open up a lot of doors, kind of modernized Chicago style blues. So, BB um, King Day, you know, is for me, very appropriate, you know, and, and very significant because uh, I lived, you know, those days and the music, you know, carried a lot of us through, you know, the trials and tribulations of the day. And basically, uh, the music was everything, you know, and in, in Chicago area, you know, this area called Jewtown, you know, it's like a lot of the street musicians would play music down there. So whenever you go down to Jewtown, you know, the merchants were selling in the middle of the street and just the whole area. And the whole thing was about the music. You know, it's like Jewtown would not have worked without the blues. You know, and B.B. King kind of, you know, kept the blues alive during that particular era, that things were becoming more modern. People were working in the steel mill, you know. So, um, yeah, very significant. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and as you t we talk about the significance of the music, how appropriate do you think uh, this year's symposium theme, which is women in blues. How appropriate do you think that topic is in today's time? And what are you hoping uh, students are able to take away from today's symposium? 
Well, it's, it's, you know, I feel like it's extremely appropriate and maybe somewhat overdue, you know, because women were right there, you know, in the trenches with the hard hats on. I mean, you know, they were out there too. But most of the music is celebrating, you know, the men in blues, you know. So yeah, it's, I, I think it's, it's a, you know, of great importance. Okay, uh, and my final question to you is, of today's events, I know we still got a lot to do today, but what has been your favorite part so far? Uh, just, you know, the history and evolution of what's going on, you know, bring us up to date, you know, roots, the roots of it all. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Sam, for taking time to uh, I got one so the people who are so here, we were in about, contact, what are you trying to keep this together? COVID purchase your house, together. and I've asked me about the significance of the house, who came to the house, so you know, the, the whole Jesse kind of thing. So, that is okay. Okay. Years seems to be I lived in I lived in Minneapolis for about 15 well, years, and. About six months after I got to Minneapolis, I was able to purchase a house. And I was only like 23 years old. So not only was I one of the youngest black persons to have a house, but in our circles, in our musical circles, I was the only musician who had a house. So whenever uh, people like Alexander O'Neill, I'm not sure if you know who that is, but Alexander O'Neill is from I think he's from Natchez, between Natchez and Meridian. But uh, he came to Minneapolis. He has some hit records, so he used to stay in my house. You know, Prince was a friend of mine. He used to come to my house. Uh, Jesse Johnson, who was one of the greatest guitar players, he used to stay in my house. Morris Day from the group The Time, he used to live in my basement. So it was it was a musical house, and a lot of the people who used to stay in the house became successful and some even stars and some even superstars and the significance is I still have the house <laughs> okay okay thank you okay thank you sir Okay, Mr. Rogers. So, oh, man. I just want to start off by, of course, thanking you for being here on this uh, very big day for Mississippi, State, uh, Mississippi Valley State, as well as B.B. King, as we're honoring women in music. Yeah. Um, first, uh, my first question for you is, I want to ask, how appropriate do you think uh, the topic of women in music and honoring them today, how appropriate is that topic for the time we live in today? So, oh, it's really in uh, with women, they deserve it, you know, because um, in a sense, they've been held back to a certain extent because they were mostly, we all look at it like uh, they was mostly for just for raising kids and stuff, being a wife, you know, cooking or whatever. But um, if you just you look at the real reality, it was like that because it wasn't just, I mean, it's nothing against the white man, but it, it just was the way it was, you know. That's where they had, you know, they women didn't work, you know. So they didn't, so I women, we didn't let them to work. But they worked anyway because. They always put them in the field and shit, especially in this house, you know, through the slave thing. And then it was time to let our women shine, you know, where they, they, they could shine at, you know. Because you always had ladies. Ladies always could sing. A lot of them always could play some music. But we would allow them to do it, you know. But, um, I mean, today, I mean, that's why I'm glad to be here to see and hear this, you know. See a lot of people, um, you know, um, didn't understand, you know, that 
A lady can play a guitar. Ladies can play just like guys. But Ed, Ed Bob and Ray were saying, you know, they got another place. Even if they're not playing music, singing music. They've they been singing all the time. Because so with that the lady voice in there, in a group, you know, especially a choir, you, you must have some ladies in there. Now, guys, you know, we always had quartets. You know. But today, I must take my head off to the ladies. Because I know my sisters always could sing, and all of them. And I got some, I got some of them playing keyboards and everything. Yes, and my family, a whole bunch of them. We got some beautiful news for yeah. you today, y'all. One more question for you. I'm, I'm going to keep it too long, so we can get back to the symposium. I saw you up there performing yeah. with uh, Miss Nelly Mack and B.B. Queen. Yeah. What was it like performing up there? Because I know Miss Mack, she's very lively on her bass, so what is it like oh, performing yeah. with them? How was that experience? Oh, nice. Nelly, Nelly she, she played with me a lot of times. A whole lot of times. Her brother did too. Her older brother, he used to play with me. With me and Bobby Ray. Way back. 20, 25 years ago. Now, y'all might not know it, but I did. Oh, he died. And then, uh, and the, uh, uh, what's the name of uh, uh, BB Queen. The lady, I, got a I know her from Detroit. Yeah, I, I used to live in Detroit. Because I was in Motown. Yeah, so no, I, was, I was at Temptations. And I went, me and Marvin Gaye went there together from Chicago area. Because that's why I came out of Chicago area. But I was born down in Mississippi. But, you know, like two years old, my father was in the, in the Army, you know, got. I mean, came and got me, and I was raised up that way. But, and been in music ever since I was a kid. So anyway, this ever video since I was a kid. Smith, Jackson, I saw you up there, and you can still hold your own today, so that's, that's a good deal. Oh, yeah, I wanted to let them play, play off what they could so do, you know, because they already nice know what I do, you know. Right. So, 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 I'm on a thousand uh, people's records on all across the country, and you know, I play on, no, I read, I play the Bobby Ray, so a whole lot, then they used to say, uh, you know, Tyrone Davis, you know, even from, even back from Jimmy Henry, and then I went to Jackson 5, you know, playing guitar for them, and shit, me and I with Marvin Gaye, you know, and then out of Philadelphia, I did all stuff like that. I, I guess you were young, you may not remember Chuck Jackson, people like that. Uh, back in 1936, and she, Teddy Pendergraph, you know, the OJs, you know. I did guitar, like stuff, a whole lot of them. Then I do my own thing too, you know. And I have my own band. And we, back, we would have been just now about getting back from overseas. They put uh, me for that, uh, that, you know, and that, that, that. Like that Dominic came up and messed up everybody, you know, for a whole year and a half. No plan, you know. All I was doing and, is going uh, to go places, you know, the studio work. But I've been ready to get back out there, you know. I'm sitting laying around doing nothing, I'm sitting around in these houses and stuff. And she had this big booming voice. Yeah, spending all the money that you made, you know. Yeah, she was doing that. And 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 she was doing that. Studio, now, that's all I've been doing for the last few in months. In but I'm going to get back on the road now. So yep. Man, I, love I, love you mm -hmm. I said, staying in the music keeps you young. Huh? Well, it keeps you feeling good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and keeps your pocket young. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. All right. This one was in the turn of the 1950s. You know, people think the civil rights movement was in the 60s, but the civil rights movement brought people together for music, especially rock and roll, because you see how Chuck Berry would come out there and do his thing, and 
uh, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis would come out there and do his thing, Bo Diddley, you know, they, they liked all that music, so it was music that they had kindred spirits with. So I'm going to play a little bit of her whole lot of shaking going on. And I also, I think I recorded this on my, uh, I, I think I did, because I do it on my shows. But it's a, a whole lot of shaking going on on one of the CDs that I did. It's called The Two Big M's. And then I wrote a uh, original tune, and one of the guys that's a, a DJ, he said, that's the best original tune, tribute tune I've ever heard. And I said, you're not saying that because it's me. He said, no. I'm going to keep my mask on. Did you take yours off? Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. So, tell me your name. My name is uh, Anna Coday. I'm the widow of Bill Coday. So, tell me a little bit about your role with your husband in terms of his music. And how did all that happen and come about? Well, it happened because my husband had been singing for a long time. And well, we got married in 2002, 2001. That's when I got married. And he uh, he was with a record label. And when we got married, and I moved from Michigan to Memphis, Tennessee, uh, I didn't like the idea of the way things was going for him being in the music business. And I told him that. Well, for one thing, I had him retired from General Motors, and I was a promoter in Flint, Michigan. And I understand a lot of music because I have been involved in it since 78 from being a promoter. So when I got married to him, I said, well, why don't we start our own record label? And he said, you got to be kidding. I said, no. Nah. I said, I don't see you getting five or ten dollars, you know. I said, you've been singing for years. So what, what's coming in the mail for you? He couldn't answer that. So I said, let's give it a try. And he said, I don't think we'll be able to do that. I said, oh, yeah. So what I decided, since I just had retired from GM, to start us a record label. So we started at B&J, which was in his name. So we got, uh, I got Jewel Joan was my first lady artist. Karen Wolf was my second artist, but Bill was the first artist, you know. And then I had James Smith. I even had Terry Wright. I had Andre Lee and Lomax. And so he told me, he said, it seemed like it might go pretty good. So he died. 2008. Denise LaSalle, for one thing, I was Denise LaSalle road manager for 17 years. And Denise and Bill Coday was like sisters and brothers. So I told Denise, I said, Denise, I think I'm finna start my own business. And she told me, go ahead on do it. That's when she told me to take Karen Wolf with me because Karen Wolf was backgrounding for her. So I started that and then after a while, man, all my music and stuff started to jump and I was playing it on WDIA and, and I was traveling and I was getting all kind of shows. And I said, we can do this ourselves. But the thing what they don't like uh, about me too much, I tell people how to help themselves. See, I don't depend on no record label taking care of me. I'm already taken care of. I had 31 years in General Motors, and then plus I'm old enough to draw Social Security too. So I don't have to have a record label, but I can teach the peoples and let them know what to expect. Why is that so important? It's so important because we are run to a place that saying, I'll record you, come to my studio, and then they'll have you to sign a contract and you never read it. See, you need to take a contract when you're starting out and you need to take it to a lawyer. You need to read it, at least give it two weeks. Take your time and read through there. Then you'll know what's going on. You don't never sign nothing until you know, not read part of it, 
read the whole contract. So you know? why is it important to have your own publishing? Your own because publishing? you make your own money. For one thing, instead of you making ten dollars, <laughs> you'll make ten million or uh, ten thousand. The main thing is start to make it. See, things unchanged, okay? Just like I was saying there on the panel. When I used to give shows, I would have sellouts. But I can't have sellouts now because I'm not running out there putting no flyers on top of no cars because people's getting shot and killed every day. And see, long time ago, we could do that. But you need to make your own money. If you write your songs and you play your music, why in the world you got to run to somebody else when you can be just as good? Because that's your song, that's your music that they got and they making money off of it, why you can't make money off of it? So maybe I'm wrong for that, maybe I get in trouble or whatever, but that's the way I look at it. I look at it, help yourself. It's time now, if you create something just like you got him doing here, why should he have somebody over him to tell him how to do this when he can make the money himself, you know? So I might be wrong for it, but that's the way I think. That's the point I wanted to bring out because these are students, and I'm trying to get them to understand. You know, if you yeah. have your own production company, and if you have an idea for concept, write it down. And one of the simple ways to do copyright is nothing else. Just keep right. it yourself. Write it yeah, down. Yeah, all you got to do something. is uh, you can you can call BMI, SCAP, or whatever in New York, Nashville and they'll send you the information to fill out where you can read or either you go on email, you know. But the main thing, I like for my paper to come to me so I can take my time and read it over. You might have a, a cell phone. Your cell phone might go out and you might not be able to read everything so you jump up and you sign a contract. Don't do that. Tell them to send you the main book and you read between your publishing because when you get in a publisher, you have to have five names because anybody else can have the same name that you got. But if you send it in, they're not going to let you have the same published name that somebody else got. You're going to have to have one that nobody ain't got. You know. So, my final question in regards to the uh, symposium, the Vivi King symposium. Uh, so, why did you decide to participate in the symposium? For one thing, they know that if they ask me, I'm going to tell them, you know, and I feel like they should know the truth. When I got into this, I was a promoter, promoted blues. I wasn't into this about being a publisher for writing or whatever, because if you write the song, you the one should get paid for the song. Now, you might decide to give me 25% of it and you keep 75 or whatever, but you need to get something. See, it's a lot of them now is not getting a thing. And then you, we don't want to leave from here when you die. What is your family going to have? The family ain't going to have nothing. Their family going to have, but you ain't going to have nothing. You the one with it. You know, so that's my main thing is I want the young people to know, read. If you come up with something that you think gonna make it, don't run and show everybody that. Because when they do, when you do that, they could be taking it down already and be on register even before you get there. You know, so that's the, that's the main thing I wanted people to read. Because we got it bad. If things sound good to us, we jump up and sign in a minute. You don't know what's up top. You know, so you need to read everything. Anything else you can share that I'm not asking that might be significant? <laughs> Look out for you. <laughs> Look out for yourself and make it for yourself. Make sure whatever you got. We don't know how long we're going to be here that you put somebody's name on where it's, it'll go to whoever, too. 
you know, don't have, you got to look in, you got to, the main thing you got to read and pay attention to what you're doing because you could be silent, some of you ain't got no business silent, you know. And then a lot of people don't like for me to tell folks, especially the people that are making all the money. They don't want me to say that. But uh, I'm at the age now that I retired. My living is already made, you know? So I'm not out here trying to take you down, take up what you got. I'm here trying to learn you to watch out for. It's time now for you to get paid. If everybody else is getting paid, you need to get paid too. And, you know, sometimes folks don't like for you to talk that, say that, but that's the way it comes. Well, thank you, you know. so much. Uh-huh. Right. Okay, good evening. How are you doing? I'm doing just dandy. How are you? I'm fine as well. And we're here with Millie Tiger Travis. So, I guess my first question would be for you. How does this event make you feel knowing that you all are finally starting to get some shine as women? Oh, it's an awesome experience. Uh, I'm a BB King fan. And the fact that they invited me this year is just totally awesome. And it's like I'm home away from home. Mississippi is my state. And I'm excited for this. And this, I think it's a great opportunity for, uh, for us as well, as well as it is for the students. OK, and what do you think can now be some of the next movements towards like bringing more light towards the women artists and about you all's accomplishments? Well, I think uh, if they do a lot more hiring women opposed to it being uh, dominating so much with the male, you know, with the, the, the males are totally dominating, but it would be great if they just reached out and if they just, like they do a whole men concert, to just reach out and do a full women concert, it would be awesome. Yeah. And can you find a couple words to maybe sum, sum up, how do you want your music to be remembered? I want my music to be, re be remembered as a Coco Taylor, as a Gladys Knight, as a Tina Turner. I want it to re be remembered as uh, to who I am, which um, I have a lot of great fans and they love me because they always tell me, oh, you don't act like the other artists, you so down to earth. And that's what I want them to always remember is that I am down to earth. Okay, and would you call yourself a legend in this industry? I am a legend in this industry. If not to anyone, I am to myself. And with holding that title, what is some things that you would like to spread on to the new up and coming? I would just say to them to read as much as you can, learn as much as you can about the industry. And I have a song and it's called Keep On Moving. And that's what I say to all the younger people that are coming, moving forward, keep on moving. And my last question for you would be, what now motivates you in this part of your life and in your career? My actions, I, I motivate me. Um, people in, in the industry that I have, that I still praise, they were a great motivation for me, but I learned through them to motivate myself. Okay, well thank you, Ms. Travis, this has been a great interview. <laughs> You're welcome. So I just want to get you to start off by telling us your name, your full name, uh, spell your first name for us, and tell us who you are. My name is Verde Beatrice Joanna De La Paz. V-E-R-T-I-E, Verde, B-E-A-T-R-I-C-E, -E, Beatrice, J-O-A-N-N, Joanne, D-E-L-A-P-A-Z, De La Paz, a.k.a. Miss Jody. Miss Jody, I love that. Thank you so much, Miss Jody. For You're welcome. Business. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. I want to start off by, as you know, today is B.B. King Day, and we had a great time up at the symposium, uh, but I just want to start off by highlighting you being a woman in blues, and what was that like for you, and knowing B.B. King as you did, what kind of experience did you all share? You know, that's my first time sitting on the panel, and I truly enjoyed it. It gave me good feeling. I, I enjoyed it. I really did. And to be able to talk to the audience to the students and share how I feel and what I think it was awesome and you had so much to share with us um, we really want to highlight one of your most memorable moments with 
be you can if you have I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I, oh, I was going to ask, if you could share one of your most memorable moments with the late B.B. King, we would love to hear what, uh, one of your experiences. Well, I never got a chance to meet him personally. Okay. And, but I've been to the museum before, and, and like I said, the day was a brand new experience for me. And it's another notch in my belt, and, as I say in the church, and I'm glad about it. <laughs> And of today, what has been your favorite part? I know you mentioned being on the panel. Um, um, what is something else that you could take away? I know the students took a lot away today, but what is something that you think you learned? I got a chance to meet some people I had never met before. I got a chance to see some familiar faces again. And just, like I said, sharing what I think, my point of view, and listening to everybody else, to their point of view. And I, really, I, I, to be honest with you, I enjoyed the whole thing. I truly did. I enjoyed it. And when they were up there doing a jam session, oh man, I was sitting there boohooing and crying. I mean, I could feel it. It was just so real. It felt so good to me. And that's Miss Jody. Yes, Thank you so much, Miss Jody, for sharing that with us. And, and you're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to take your mic. Uh-oh. Mr. White, you think you can get a picture of us? Sure. Would you take a picture sure. with me, Mr. White? Sure. Sure. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Say your name, spell it, and tell us exactly who you are. Okay. I'm Malika Polk Lee. I am the executive director of the B.B. King Museum and Delta Interpretive Center. That's M-A-L-I-K-A-P-O-L-K-L-E-E. -E. Okay. And I'm going to get to the position. This, or... this way? Yeah. Okay. You just talking to me. Talk, Talk to you, like... not the camera. Okay, got gotcha. you. All right, got gotcha. you. So, uh, of course, today is a really big day in which we're honoring Mr. King. Uh, and where we are right now, I think it's very appropriate considering that this is a day where we're remembering his legacy. Could you talk about the newest extension to the B.B. King Museum and what was the thought process behind coming up with this beautiful structure for Mr. King? So in um, June, we unveiled an expansion to the museum's permanent exhibit as well as this memorial courtyard. Um, as you know, Mr. King passed away May of 2015 and we always knew that we were going to have to tell the final chapter of Mr. King's life because the museum opened in 2008. Mr. King at that time was still touring so there was still part of his life story that was going to have to be told and so we knew that we were going to have to at some point do an expansion uh, and unfortunately it happened in 2015. The expanded exhibit tells the final chapter of his life story as well as it allows us to exhibit three artifacts, three large artifacts that were donated to us by Mr. King in 2012, which is one of his tour buses, uh, El Camino and a Rolls Royce, which were his personal vehicles. Um, and so we also get a chance in this um, final exhibit to talk more about his legacy. Um, and what he left behind as his legacy for uh, musicians to that are following, for his fans to really get a more intimate uh, look at him and, uh, and to know him better. This memorial pavilion was built around his gravesite. Mr. King was buried here on our grounds in 2015. Um, and at that time, we knew we had to create a special place around that burial site, a place where his fans could come pay their last respects, um, something fitting of his iconic status, but also that revealed and showed and fit with his humble personality. 
And so um, that is why we created this memorial pavilion in Courtyard area. Yes, ma'am. That was beautiful. Uh, I think you said a mouthful. I think you got <laughs> everything that we needed. What do you think, Mr. Orr? Sure. Uh, so what's your thoughts about uh, B.B. King Day at Mississippi Valley uh, in terms of uh, the number of years it's been going on, and especially this year that they're honoring women in the blues? You know, um, Valley was near and dear to Mr. King's heart. Um, it was uh, one of those uh, special projects when that recording studio was built and named after Mr. King. And so we thought, you know, who other fitting to have a partnership with to honor Mr. King around his birthday other than Mississippi Valley State University. And uh, Dr. Sanders, Dr. Alfonso Sanders at the time, um, you know, approached us. We had kind of thrown out, you know, what do we do for Mr. King's birthday seven years ago? And Dr. Sanders had, had this idea kind of rolling in his head and uh, he came to us with it. We partnered and decided, okay, we'll figure out how to pull this off. And, and that's what we did. And it has grown each year. Uh, and uh, we're, we're very proud to, to do this this year and partner and, and help sponsor it with Mississippi Valley State University. This year, it's honoring women. I think this is the year of the woman. Uh, if you think about it, we have our first female vice president of the United States. Uh, and if you just think about all the accomplishments that women have made uh, this year and, 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 setting, um, and setting landmark recognition and records. And so um, we wanted to do this. We, we thought about this and we thought about it and we were, I was like, this is the year of the woman. We need to honor these um, blues musicians, these women blues musicians. And so I think it goes along with the times. It's time that these women um, get their due uh, and get paid their recognition. And like they say, give them their flowers now. Add, maybe we're not asking like this, uh, like what, what else is on the horizon for the King? Let's see. Uh, Mr. King's birthday is September 16th. This is his 96th birthday. And we will on uh, September 16th um, do some special activities to actually commemorate the actual day, uh, his birthday day. And so we're looking forward to that. And, um, you know, four years from now will be his 100th birthday, the centennial. And so we're really uh, starting after this year to plan what is that going to look like because that has to be a big event, 100 years, you know. Uh, and so we really, we're, we're thinking about it now. How do we begin to start uh, honoring him and celebrating that year? Yeah. So look forward to that in the next four years. <laughs> looking forward to that. Yes. That sounds good. That's it. Okay.